Alastair Murray and I'm the Vice President of Australian Sailing. Australian Sailing is really excited to bring our Olympians into, our, into your homes and connect them with the sailing community via this Olympic webinar series. Tonight we'll be chatting to the men's 470 team who, as you all know, brought home gold from Tokyo and they have a long list of achievements on the international stage. They don't really need a lot of introduction, but Viktor Kovalenko has 11 Olympic medals under his belt, which has well earned him his status as the medal maker. Matt Belcher was recognised by the Australian Olympic team for success as the flag bearer at the closing ceremony. And on the Olympic stage, Matt and Will have a silver from Rio and a gold from Tokyo, amongst various other world championships. Just a few stats that I'd looked up uh, that, I'll, that I'll share with you. Uh, Matt is the seventh most successful Olympic sailor of all time, behind some pretty sensational names. Victor is number three on the world ranking of Olympic gold medals from sailing over the past six, six Olympics. And when I say that, Great Britain is number one with 15 medals. Australia is number two with 10 gold medals. And Victor is number three with seven gold medals. So he's the third ranked country. Tonight, uh, Matt, Will and Victor will share their experience campaigning for the Tokyo Games. There will then be an opportunity for Q&A. And, and at last uh, week's webinar with uh, Blackers, we had a lot of questions. Please leave your questions in the chat function for the, for the meeting and we'll get to as many of them as we can. And I've asked each of the uh, participants tonight, the three guys, to give very brief answers so we can deal with as many questions as we, as we possibly can. Before we pass over to Matt, Will and Victor, a quick reminder that there are a few more webinars to come. The next one will be on Tuesday next week with uh, Matt Wern. And that should be really great. And the details have been shared in the comments for that. Uh, this, uh, this webinar will finish a couple of minutes before eight o'clock, and I'm saying that because I have a Ron Stan chair me, uh, board meeting to chair from at eight o'clock, and I don't want to be late. So that's when we're finishing, because that's when I'm leaving. Well, we're, we're going to go through a presentation of uh, photographs from the guys. They will speak to these uh, photographs. Many of the photos have been taken by uh, uh, Victor himself, and um, they're the favourites they've come up with. So we're going to do a bit of a slide presentation presented by them, and then I'll come back after that and, uh, and and handle the questions from the from the audience, which we're really looking forward to. So here we go with a slide presentation. Over to you, Matt. Yeah, like. Um... This obviously sums up the the experience that we had in in you know in Tokyo to to come away with the gold medal um, after the silver in in Rio. Um, yeah, obviously some of the best best memories. And we've been a, a, a team for a really long time. It was almost ten years uh, together, uh, and to, to to celebrate to have all of us you know in that moment to to, to it was taken literally um, 20, 30 minutes after. Um, after the finishing that race, uh, yeah, it was really, really special for us all. I think um, I'll let Will jump in sometimes as well. <laughs> I think what really highlighted, uh, you know, the motivation for our for our Tokyo program uh, was actually Will's Will's face. I really loved this photo, where we're just presented with the silver medal. Um, it just sort of summed up our personality and, and the fact that, you know, we had that reaction after finishing second um, was, a, was a massive driver for, for us to, to just do that, do, do that little bit extra that we could to, to hopefully, you know, take, take that chance to be on top of the podium. And, you know, it's a five-year journey. So the fact that we were able to, to bring those emotions together and structure the program and to, to learn from, from the lessons that we did from, from the previous campaign, um, you know, it just, it was almost a fairy tale to, to be able to achieve that with everything that, you know, those 18 months, those challenges. Um, so it was, yeah, it was really special for us. In these, um, you know, in these images were, it was actually our, our first event in the bottom left corner, our first event together, Will and I, um, after um, we'd, we'd done, I think, three or four months of training, uh, beginning of 2013. And um, for Will and I to win the first event, we, we went on to actually 
we went on to, to win all those events in 2013, which was kind of a, a unique situation for us. We were a new partnership. We'd done a lot of training. We were highly motivated. Um, but to, to really balance that year, um, to have such a lot of success in that, that first year um, and to then trying to continue that um, was, was really challenging for us. And I think, you know, Victor obviously helped us a lot to, to balance the psychology um, to, to keep, keep pushing ourselves and to keep focused on, on what that, you know, the end goal was with Rio. Um, the 2019, the top right and, and bottom, um, bottom right images are, are from the, the World Championships in, in 2019 in the Olympic venue, which gave us, um, you know, a lot of confidence that we could perform um, in Olympic waters. And, and the top left images, uh, image was, was actually taken at Coffs Harbour. We had to be very creative in our training um, because we'll, lives in New South Wales. I live in Queensland with the border bubbles. We, we had to establish four or five different training centers on the East coast, depending on what restrictions that we had. Um, and that was, you know, a really enjoyable moment. I'm not trying to get too close to it, to a whale. So instead of what's around us, we had a lot of whales. Yeah, I think um, this image on the right was actually taken after we we had, we it was the morning after of uh, of finishing the Olympics, and we we were trying to close the container door. We had so much equipment; uh, it was high thirties, uh, super super hot, and all we wanted to do was just to get that equipment inside and, and have a break. Um, but just as we were closing the door, we packed everything. the The container door had been damaged when they when they put it down. And uh, we were getting a little bit frustrated, so we were really giving it everything we could to um, to close the door. Do you want to jump in here, Will? Reliving it. I was enjoying reliving it while you were telling the stories, Maddie. But um, <laughs> yeah, this is a little bit of our container, container setup that we had in. in uh, Tokyo. We're really fortunate to have a quite a close knit family group in Japan. And considering the circumstances where we were fairly isolated in our accommodation, and then also within the village, this um, these two containers kind of were our home away from home. And we had the food in the fridge there, two aircon units in each of the containers to to keep us cool. And this is kind of where the magic happened. We had Thorpey doing a lot of the boat building behind the scenes. Um, we had the support team of Caroline and Sam Ellis and, and Richard Slater working away in the back of one of the containers, just providing all the logistical support. Um, we had the physios operating inside those containers as well, uh, plus all of the, the athletes and coaches. So um, you, get, you have to be pretty tight knit to kind of live in that small space all together and to keep it clean and, and efficient. But I think that was what was so special about um, that experience is what we'll remember as well as uh, the people that were there. And um, the pitch on the right is Maddie doing the the uh, boat work as usual. I think I'm probably socialising in the background and um, getting getting the boat ready for racing. <laughs> yeah, we were a little bit lucky with location of our container because all containers <coughs> were located next to the boat park, and it was a lot of energy inside like a lot of egos a lot of negative energies and a lot of positive energies and uh, and we were like a countryside we, we, we had six containers which which were located across the road from olympic parking and our was uh, absolutely in the corner and you can see the atmosphere next to the container everything relax and uh, focusing on things and uh, really, really good place where we are very lucky. Thank you. Yeah, this, this image um, was taken up in the main village in Tokyo. Uh, Will and I were really fortunate that we could stay a few extra days uh, for the closing ceremony. So we, we had a bit of a tour around the main village. We, we played tourists for for a couple of days and to have a look at the other athletes and just to speak to them and, and to get a bit of Olympic spirit uh, was, yeah, it was really cool. This was in the, the Samsung lounge, um, trying to get as much freebie stuff as we could, I think, <laughs> whatever was left uh, before everybody, um, before everyone packed up. 
Yeah, this um, this is probably one of the one of the highlights actually. Uh, uh, to be able to spend a bit of time with with the Boomers, um, to sort of celebrate with them after their their bronze medal match, and to actually you know um, have quite a few conversations with with Patty Mills, um, who was the the flag bearer for the opening ceremony, and we sort of sweet talked to Ian Chesterman, who um, was the Australian team chef to mission to allow Will and I to actually uh, get on um, to to that to that um, that, that court. And, and watch it live, which was really, really cool. Um, as you can see in the background of that image, when they were getting their bronze medal, there's almost no one in the, the um, up on the court stands. Um, so to be able to do that was actually the first time I've really ever watched anyone else compete at an Olympics. So that was that was really special, um, and yeah, such a historic moment for for Australian basketball. Just to to watch that live was really special. Yeah, this was, um, this was, we had a bit of a, um, we, we obviously couldn't do the opening ceremony um, with, with COVID protocols, but we, we do have a bit of a tra tradition, uh, tradition that we like to dress up in our opening um, ceremony uniform. Uh, it was just sort of Will and I, we brought the full uniform over from Australia uh, just for, for, you know, the, the opening and it was, it was nice. We, we, yeah, we were able to, to sort of celebrate as if um, we were there in person and, and we watched it on TV with the rest of, of the Australian uh, sailing um, Olympic team, which was really cool. This is definitely Will's favourite moment. Um, after the games, we able to eat whatever he wants. Uh, as you can see in the background, um, I, I think it can probably house about 5,000 people. Uh, you can see just on the edge of the image, we had screens, so um, you, you wouldn't be able to you know, to minimise the contact, and uh, particularly with COVID and separation. But you could basically have whatever you wanted, uh, twenty four seven, which was which was really cool. Um, it is the same food though, uh, twenty four seven. Uh, but you know, yeah, it was just an amazing experience. The food courts, two levels, um, so so many people, um, and as you can imagine. You walk around there just seeing all the different athletes from from all over the world um it was yeah it's always a, a, a you know highlight of the games um this image was was taken in 2019 uh during one of the i think the training just before the 470 world championships were there and in, in um, the end of july uh, of mount fuji which was pretty yeah pretty cool it's pretty rare to actually see Mount Fuji um, whilst we were there. I think we only saw uh, probably about four or five times. Uh, we did see during the Olympic trip, which was really special. Um, but um, yeah, it's just a really uh, sort of iconic shot of us training and the background and very distinct of you know, Tokyo waters. Yeah, this was um, the last day. I think we we're just about to head out on the plane. Um, and yeah, just to get the Olympic rings in the background, you can see the, the the accommodation in the main main village up in in Tokyo. You can see just on the the top right hand side that was the Australian um, village. So we had the whole whole hotel there, and uh, yeah, just to get a get a photo. It was pretty hard to actually get this photo. We had to go around the other side. You can see the the sort of the, the bum of another guy um above my head uh yeah everyone wanted to, to get this to get this photo that was the best that we we could do but we got my my thought as will said before is um was the it was our boat build or support um yeah we've got sam ellis got tristan brown the laser radial coach uh, and sam was our tech, technical advisor and uh and, and will and i were able to to stay in the main village uh for a couple of days after we we finished before flying back Yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, I think the the timing uh, of trying to use the ice bath, that one ice bath at the main the main village on the right hand side, it was probably a bit of a regular occurrence. Um, you know, after each day we would do his ice bath. Um, on the left hand side, you can see we're doing our washing to try and come back because we knew when we were going back into hotel quarantine that we wouldn't be able to to have access to a washing machine. So. We um, right outside uh, our Olympic containers. We're doing our laundry, which was kind of a surprise to the Japanese officials um, as to what we were doing. But it uh, it did actually dry in about 20 minutes because of the heat, which was very very useful.
yeah, this is the you know the moment we we cross the the finish line um, of the of the medal race. Just that relief and that excitement that we got around the medal race without breaking anything. Um, although Will's effort of trying to pump the rig during the medal race, which you would have seen, um, gave it a, a good crack. But um, but yeah, just so so happy that you know really coming back to that image that we saw um, standing second in in Rio, um, and just yeah to know that we. We, we were able to to achieve achieve our dream, which was really really cool. Um, you know, these these are a part of the celebration um, as we had finished. I really, you know, I really the two images that really sort of well, the three images really stand out. Um, you can see that it's just such a big big family um, family sort of environment, particularly in the 470 in that top right image. Um, you know, really stay with us for for a long time. Um, we've just been awarded the medals, and and to to celebrate together that we know that the 470 men's class will will no longer exist, and the women going mixed. Um, to be able to share that that moment and to um to to hug each other and embrace was was really cool. Um, you know, the bottom left image. Um, you know, Will and Jamie. Uh, you know, how cool is that? The, the second games together, um, and to be able to support each other as brother and sister. And to follow that Olympic path is, you know, is phenomenal. Um, you know, Victor and Ian, um, absolutely massive, massive part of it. And, and you know, it's just all those weeks, months, years of training together to, to put it all together when it counted, just within that one week of the five years training. But the, the four years preparation before that, um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of emotions and um, yeah, the whole, whole team was, was with us. So that's the uh, the photographic presentation from the guys, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, everybody, that uh, they, were, they were a lot of fun and uh, uh, really helped bring the Olympic experience into our into our lounge rooms. Uh, I've got a I've got a couple of questions. I've got, I can see a few coming in now, but um, I'll, I'll start with a couple. My first one's to Will. So, Will, I've got to congratulate you on achieving your goal of coming top 100 in the Moth Worlds. I thought that was a pretty lofty goal, and quite frankly, you did amazingly well just to get to get around the course every day. But top 100, you, I think you got well inside that. But after trapezing all your life, I, I believe you found it a little bit, bit bit difficult to hike on a dinghy. Was that something you really struggled with? Yeah, absolutely. I was. Um, I think I was shocked to, to get into the top 100 after that first day of hiking. I've um. I thought I was an athlete before I went there, but I've never been so sore as trying to do that hiking thing <laughs> five days in a row. So, um, yeah, by the second last day, I could barely sit on the side. But, uh, yeah, it gives me, a, a, I guess, a greater awareness of what Matt's been doing all these years. So, um, yeah, he can keep hiking. I'm happy to trapeze. That's fine with me. <laughs> well, all joking aside, congratulations on even just doing it. You know, I mean, that was, that was fantastic, particularly straight after the Olympics. Um, I know you guys had uh, breakfast with Matt Wern every day and he finished his event well before you guys. What was it like sitting down with him, having him won his gold medal already and you're still in the heat of the co your competition? Did the vibe change? Did he keep himself contained? What was what was breakfast like with Matt? Yeah, no, breakfast was great with, with Matt. I think he'd heard the story, which I told a few times within internally within the Australian sailing team when I was rooming with Tom Burton and Jason back in in Rio, where Tom had, had finished a couple of days before, and and we tried to we sort of have our house rules, and we you know he, he wanted to make sure that the medal wouldn't be too distracting for for the for the rest of us, uh, Jason and myself competing. So he, he put the medal away and he had breakfast at the same time. We sort of had the same conversation, and and Maddie uh, Maddie really took took that on, and you know having finished you know a good uh, I think three days it was. In the end, before before the majority of the team, particularly us, that we were we were the last one. Um, yeah, it was really it was really great. He just sort of acted like nothing happened, but it was you know obviously you know he he'd won. We knew that, uh, but he was really trying to sort of downplay that a little bit, and and it just showed the strength of of the team. It showed Absolutely. the respect, and um, yeah, it was really really it was really cool. Being able to contain his emotions like that, um, yeah, that, that's a great achievement in itself. 
So we're going to go to the questions. We're, they're really uh, flying in now. And um, the first one actually relates to emotions and it relates to Victor. Uh, Jeffrey has asked the question, and it's really a question of Matt and Will. Is, Vic, is Victor ever hard on you? He looks so relaxed and smiling all the time. So I guess the question is, is he always this uh, friendly, uh, happy-go-lucky, or does he does he lose it at times? We'd love to hear about what Victor's really like, and then we might give Victor the right of reply. I don't know who's, who wants to start. Um, you know, Victor's, Victor's, he's, over the last 20 years, he's, he's you know, been, been my father, he's been my mentor, he's, you know, he's been, been my friend, he's been my coach. Um, certainly, as the later part of our, our campaign to get those extra one percenters, we have to be be tough on each other. Um, but it's it's out of out of really trying to get the best. We we have a really strong working relationship, but we also have to be able to to challenge each other to to um, get that get that best best performance out of us. And we have so much deep respect. Um, it's always calm, and um, yeah, it's always in in the right direction. But yeah, certainly he's he's pretty pretty tough. So, Victor, what, 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 are you as are you as friendly and calm as you always appear? You always got a smile on your face. Uh, yes, uh, smile after competition. <laughs> <laughs> In competition, it's much more easier. Like <clears throat> our Olympic games. <clears throat> sorry, our Olympic games were very simple competition to all of us. Uh, except of Matthew and William. They, they were working very hard physically, but I would say our preparation before the games was the most toughest part of our campaign, much more tough than competition. Because uh, what we said when we decided in 2017 to do one more Olympic campaign, decision was made on the only one goal to obtain gold medal and that and that's why all of these five years we were pushing each other enormously and uh, I'm sure boys they had a tough time uh, <clears throat> uh, during these five years but for me it also it was also, very tough time because they are very strong personalities and became stronger and stronger because my job is to make them stronger and when they became stronger they became stronger also also on me and but you know the what we are saying if your pets are tigers you have to be ready to be stretched <laughs> yeah Good, so because... and that's that's the point yeah. The competition, that's why competition was so easy. Yeah, like it's even nothing to say to you about competition because we were working for five years to make it as simple as possible. Nothing happened with equipment, nothing happened with athletes, nothing happened with it. Everything was absolutely under control um, due to Matthew and uh, sense the will, everything was because they were changing ropes, not where they are teared off a little bit. No, as soon as they changed the color, became a little bit blur, change the ropes. <laughs> that was the rule. And uh, this rule was working in all areas of our preparation. We were working in advance, making every step only in advance, only in advance. Sense to will, that was his rule. And all steps in advance, and that's make it's definitely make our preparation tough. But competition was so easy. Thanks, Victor. Question from Sarah: How did you find out you were chosen to be the closing ceremony flag bearer, uh, Matt? How did you find out, and how was the experience of doing that? Um, I found out through Ian Chesterman. He he called me. Um, the the next morning, uh, unfortunately, I missed quite a few of the calls because we were uh, packing our, our container, um, and it was from an Australian number, and I don't normally answer during during Olympic competition, and I didn't realise it was it was him. Um, but yeah, he he told me a couple of hours later, um, which was really really special, and to to have the honour to 
to represent the Australian Olympic team. Um, you know, it was just just an amazing, amazing experience. Uh, it was super special, and to for for Will to be there um, uh, and to be able to to stay an extra couple of days with all the restrictions and the the protocols from the IOC in Tokyo 2020 was was re was yeah was definitely the the, the highlight for us. Fantastic. So the next one I'm going to add is from a I'm I'm picking it as a young person because his name's Finn and uh, old people are not called Finn. So so young Finn Blachen, hi guys and congratulations on your result. How do you deal with on the water pressure? That rush of adrenaline you get before a start can impact decision making, and I know for sure I've made some stupid mistakes under pressure. Do you? What, what, what's your response to that? Will you have a go? I'm just a passenger. I've got the easy job, so I thought it'd be a good question for the skipper. But <laughs> I think practice is what helps make it a little bit easier. Um, trying to simulate some of those experiences through time, and and it's certainly something that Victor brings a lot of experience to. Um, to, to be in the right mindset and to, to practice each training session as though it's the real deal so that when you get there, it's not too special um, and that you feel comfortable. We were lucky to go to Japan. We'd seen those people on the race start line before and um, yeah, I just left it to Maddie. It was pretty easy after that. Yeah. I've got a question here from uh, Chris Dance, which is a very uh, current one, uh, my friend Chris. Was there any fear of getting a positive COVID test before the medal race? Like, you know, I mean, that must have been weighing on your minds. Yeah, it was particularly at the end of mm. the competition. Um, you know, as the restrictions and people's approach generally eased a little bit, uh, it was still very, very tight and very restrictive. But it always plays on your mind. You know, particularly when you you were in the position, we just needed to get around the course. We just didn't want anything to to go wrong, and and that was certainly you know we were doing everything we can to to make sure or minimize our minimize our contacts. <laughs> Welcome to the family. <laughs> Yeah. Question, question for Victor uh, from um, Jeff Loosemore of Middle Harbour Amateur Sailing Club. What is the ideal number of boats for doing upwind speed and height training? What is the ideal number of boats to be training with? Uh, I would say <clears throat> maximum four. And um, I, I would say optimal could be three because if we have two watches, we don't know which one is <laughs> showing the exact time. But when we have three, it's more obvious. Yeah. And if we have four boards, one board always could be surprised in different conditions because all of these four boards would have their own specialities. One is good in strong wind, one is good in light wind, one is good in upwind, downwind, and uh, if we have more, four boats, we have much more varieties, speed varieties. But I would say optimized is three. Okay. And four is just a bonus. Thank you. For Will, um, the next one's from Rebecca about what kind of physical training you do as a crew. I've directed this one to you because I've seen you really suffering from what looked to me like over sailing, over training, struggling with injuries. I've seen you doing a tougher time. So. Give us a bit of perspective on your physical training. Yeah, I think the sailing classes have evolved over the years that now there's a lot of pressure to be really professional and trying to be uh, an athlete. Um, and I guess for me, I take a lot of my motivation from from the other sports people that I look at, whether it's the Tour de France cyclists or um, the athletic runners. I guess you've got to be a full package and, and ready to compete for what seems like a marathon. It's a full week of racing. Um, at the world championships and at the Olympic games and a lot of extra pressure. So for me, my fitness was basically anything that could push my endurance. Um, and I love cardio sports for the 470. I also have to keep my weight down quite a lot. So um, it means I'm more biased towards cardio, longer runs and bike rides and swimming, things like that. And I use other competitions such as triathlons or fun run events to, to keep that motivation um, and to kind of cross train a bit more broadly, I guess, to, to be ready for the sailing. And then obviously the sailing itself is the, the best training you can do. Yeah, great. And this one's obviously a bit of a Dorothy Dixer from a mate of yours, Will. It's from Tex. Is it true a green cookie is a tradition since a little boy? What's what's the story behind that one? <laughs> yeah, it's a small world, so I'm, I can probably guess who this came from. But uh, as a little boy, well before I learned how to sail, um, 
uh, our neighbor Nola, she used to cook, or I used to apparently help cook green cookies and it was always a favorite as a kid. So um, there's certainly some secret success in that. And yeah, hopefully, hopefully there's a few more left over for the years to come. <laughs> Oh, good. The next one's from Chris Simons from Wynyard in Yacht Club, Wynyard Yacht Club in Tasmania, who's a parasailer and X470 sailor himself. And this is very, I think this is a really good question because it relates to the different preparation that Australia had compared to the people that were able to sail against other boats. His question is, well, congratulations to you. Can you explain your training by yourself in the lead up? Many say, many say you need a team and boats to compete against, but you kind of disproved that. You went out there and dominated without the benefit of that. Well, uh, perhaps Matt, you could have a go at that first. Yeah, so really, it was a new world for us, to, to be honest. We we predominantly just based our program over in Europe, and we we went from summer to summer. So we we anywhere in a year, we would do sort of nine to ten competitions. We we thought we would struggle quite a lot with domestic based training, particularly that that volume. And I think what what made it a little bit easier is that we we didn't actually know it would be 18 months. It was kind of like you would do four months and then you have a little bit of hope and then maybe you could travel and then another three or four months. So it sort of dragged it out a little bit, which probably helped a lot psychologically. But we, we just had a very detailed plan. You know, we, we were absolutely very structured in what we, the skills that we needed to develop through our experience. Um, and I think a, a little bit lucky, to, to be honest, to be able to to get through through those periods and to keep enough volume of training with with COVID um, and I think it's not just a matter of domestic based training but it was also the health restrictions within Australia which added a um, you know a large complexity to to our preparation but yeah it works this time I'm not saying it might work again but um, you know with all the experience that we have um, with the with the team and the support that we had domestically we, we were able to to make it work. Thanks a question from Greg Hines I'm, I'm assuming this is a serious question it does play a role for a lot of people. What pump up pump up music do you listen to? Now I'm, I'm assuming Matt would probably be in excess from that era. Victor might be more classical, but uh, is is there any particular music that gets you going? Nah, not 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 really. Just uh, whatever's whatever's the latest. I try and uh, upgrade a bit to make me feel a bit younger. Uh, <laughs> Victor, you you're, you've got uh... fine tastes. Uh, my favorite is Dirty Dirty. This is very, very special rhythmic music, which is very good for everything. Very good for pumping for Will, and <laughs> very good also for, um, how we can, we can say, uh, yeah, and very good for exercises, very good for running, very good for everything. But it's a little bit strange music. I'm sure Will, he knows Dirty Dirty, yeah? It's only Will knows. Yeah. Only I've definitely, knows. I've definitely heard Victor's morning workout songs, but um, I must comment that in Japan, every morning breakfast was classical uh, Mozart, Beethoven, and a few others. And now, when you hear it, it definitely brings back good memories of breakfast in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So, uh, the, the next question is from uh, Brian. Uh, he'd like to know when competing at a level as high as the Olympics. How do you look for opportunities to gain distance on the fleet? <clears throat> What's more important, gaining tactically or just raw boat speed? And I know the answer is both, but perhaps you could comment on boat speed versus tactics. I, thought, I guess a fast boat makes your tactics look good. Yeah, exactly, Alistair. I think speed, anyone would, would want to have greater speed. It makes you look uh, like a genius at, at times. I can certainly get you out of some really difficult um, positions but you know I think at, at the level particularly you know with 470s and, and at Olympics that the, the difference between teams is so small you know at any given moment though um, you know particularly in 470 that they could they can win the regatta um, certainly win multiple multiple races so you know we were just focusing on the small one percenters just be be a little bit faster at the start be a little bit closer to the line a little bit better position just a little bit better speed um, you know, a little bit better communication, position our boat um, a little bit more in advance than, than the others and, and try and make, you know, make less mistakes. And it sounds pretty easy, but, you know, we really just focus on um, simplify it in, in a very sort of complex in, environment. And we just did that a little bit better uh, for that week. Okay, I'm going to roll a few questions into one here. So I've got uh, Natalie Farrell here, Kaylin and Miles Baron Hay, Baron Hay, who have all asked really about your future. I'll ask each of you to comment on it. They'd all like to know um, 
you know, the gold medal was a fantastic conclusion. The men's Olympic 470 class, obviously that's not available to you anymore. Uh, what do, where, do, where does each of you go from here uh, to the degree that you know? And, um, and, and Kaylin's asked, when did you decide that you wanted to be an Olympian? So perhaps you could, each one of you, each one of the three of you could say a little bit about your future and um, what made you want to be an Olympian? Perhaps Victor first. This is the most difficult question, probably. <laughs> yes. You may not very, know. Very difficult question, right? Because all of us, we decided, like, to to finish after this Olympic gold medal. And uh, but it's very difficult to say. For example, for and for William, they are very young. They can do whatever they want <laughs> and they will be successful in whatever they want because what we will learn from this tough time, from our, especially from our last campaign, because our last campaign was the best university, the best academy of life. Yes, we learn how to reach our goals and we have learned how to make things happen. And that's that is their biggest strength in this life now. Whatever they will decide now, for Matthew to be Prime Minister of Australia or for <laughs> William to be America's Cup winner or to be, yeah, William was only one Iron Man in for 70 fleet. <laughs> and uh, it's everything is possible for them. But for me, it's difficult because uh, like all my life, all things around me in my flat, in my bags, in my garage are collected or assembled to make people winners, to make me working hard in this field and uh, to and what I what I have to do now if I will stop coaching it's finished I will die in two years <laughs> but if I will do coaching at any level at any yeah. level uh, I will be very happy I will be happy to coach uh, um, Optimist team I will be happy to coach for twenty team I will be happy to coach any class. America's Cup or whatever federation will decide, I will do because okay. coaching is my mission, and I I can stop my work for medals, but I cannot stop my mission definitely. Thanks, Victor. There's a, there's an opening in the Tazar class that I'm aware of for a coach. I might be. Uh, I'll come I'm open, <laughs> absolutely open, because coaching okay. this is fantastic, and this is this is not about money anymore. This yeah. is all about to that, help people. That's good, Victor, because we don't have any. Now, uh, Matt, um, uh, Victor mentioned you for Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> with the current crop that we've got, I'd, I'd certainly vote for you. Uh, <laughs> but perhaps you could respond to the question about where you go from here. And, and I know that it is difficult because not all the decisions have been made. And you know, But people would love to hear why you wanted to become an Olympian and what perhaps your future might hold. Yeah, I think it's it's just quickly, it's it's really special. You can see that the relationship that we have uh, with mm. the three of us, and even though we're finished, Victor still, um, you know, provides that that guidance and that support and, and that passion. And I think for, for 20 years, when I first really decided to, I really wanted to be Olympian at the Sydney Olympics, you know, to, to have someone so special and so passionate like Victor to, to, to support you, you know, you, you realise how, how amazing our, our world is. Um, it's certainly not the last time you know, our, our group will be together, and, and you know I'm sure Will and I will be on a, on, a, on another boat. Um, you know, I can definitely say say that we we love sailing together. I love sailing with Will, and and that detail, and and just all those experience and those those collective moments. So we're definitely doing some other sailing. Um, I'd like to do the Hobart this year if I can, um, mm -hmm. and I'd like to do a little bit of offshore racing just to have a bit more of an all round and. Whenever anyone asks you in the street, you know, if, you, if you've done a Hobart and you say no, they sort of get quite disappointed. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you've done um, outside of that. So I'd like to be able to say, yes, I've done a Hobart like Will. And um, so, yeah, we'll see see how that goes. But 
you know, I've been back only three weeks, you know, with, with two weeks hotel quarantine, um, a lot of time away this year and um, just really enjoy being home with the kids and, and um, you know, in the next few months we'll make some decisions about, about Olympic and yeah, but at the moment just enjoying being at home and enjoying being with family. Good answer. Yeah. I've never done a Hobart either, uh, Matt. People cannot believe it when I tell them that because it's so such an Australian thing to do. Will, what's your rap? Uh, are you aiming for, to win a, uh, a Moth Worlds at some stage? You've got a bit of an improvement to make. <laughs> I think I learned in the Moth Worlds that uh, you've got to spend some money if you want to win. So um, <laughs> that might be my future life once I have a real job. Um, but maybe I'll start with the other end of the question, which is why I got into the Olympics. For yeah. me, I got into sailing for an enjoyment. Um, it's something my grandfather got me into, and, and I love the sport. But the Olympic dream was never something for me uh, early on. I, I remember seeing my very first Olympic medal, uh, which was Tom King's in, in 2000 um, in a state performance squad camp he came to visit. And I thought it was really cool, but it didn't certainly didn't even ignite any dream for me then. It took some time. Um, and it was meeting Victor in Middle Harvey Yacht Club, and I guess you can see his passion. And um, <laughs> he sells the dream pretty well. And I think that's what got me inspired to, to get involved with that. Um, it was also a good chance to go to Europe and skip my university exams for that semester. Um, but what's really cool about the Olympic project and what I'm looking for in something going forwards is is that kind of ongoing pursuit of, 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 of a passion project. You've got some time to to make the gains, to kind of reflect on it, to look for those improvements and to continue forward. So um, I think we're all like-minded in that respect, a little bit perfectionist inside of us, but also kind of driving for more. So whatever the future ends up bringing, it'll be something that's like that. It's not just a, a one day kind of hit out, um, but it'll be something to, to build towards. So, yeah, I don't know what it might be, but I'm definitely looking forward to it. Great. So I, I do apologize to everybody out there that's asking questions that we don't get to because there's so many of them, but um, we've only got 10 minutes left and I'm just trying to choose a few here. Pete has asked, watching the tracker, your starts were extraordinarily consistent in approach and middle to the middle to, to, to in approach and middle to middle right positioning. What are the most important factors to executing a good start? And it was you had you generally decided that's the area of the line you wanted to be at, Matt? Yeah, it's um it's a bit of a habit of us actually. Yeah. I'm not sure whether I th I've seen some of our competitors actually on on this chat. Um, yeah, we typically just favoured favoured that sort of um just underneath the boat the boat end pack. Um, it was just a, it was sort of suited our style of, of racing to be able to start. Um, we knew that the density would be a little bit less. Um, we still have pretty good line, line judgment as well. Um, we did some analysis during the games and we were able to be, you know, closer than any other team, but also at full speed. And I think just being away from that main, main group enabled us to, to start strong and, and gave ourselves plenty of options as the race opened up in, in picking the strategy or having to adjust strategy um, but we you know we that was one of the things we had to work on a lot by ourselves. it was something that we could simulate by ourselves. Um, if you ask any of our competitors we're not strong starters we we were absolutely terrible at the end uh, but you know we we had really good judgment and really good acceleration and that, that helped us a lot particularly in a smaller boat fleet like the olympics as opposed to a world where we've got you know double you know almost two and a half times the, the amount of boats yeah I'm sure your competitors actually would have one goal with their starting, and that's to not be next to you <laughs> on either side. Because yeah. I think you're, I think you're being very modest about about your starts. Uh, for you, um, Will, this is from Ian Taylor. I'm guessing it's String. What sail training electronics do you use? Uh, example, Sailmon, which you'd be no doubt be aware of. Or have you done so much of it now that you know when you're on the pace or not by pure feel? Like even in your training, how much assistance do you get from uh, electronic gadgetry? Yes, so within our racing, the only electronics we can use is a, a countdown watch for the start, uh, always runs in the course, and <laughs> we can use a, an electronic compass to, to kind of gauge a wind shift left or right. So that's the extent of our, of our onboard electronics. But certainly in the training, you look for different ways to be creative, to, to build that kind of feeling. Um, Sometimes we use Victor and the coach boat as our reference to, we'd use the other boats to, to train against or, or other fin boats, but we did use the Salmon. Um, the Vaporos is another good one. And there's also Garmin watches that display speeds similar to what you have on, on big boats. So 
we tried to bring some of that technology across to, to utilize, but at the end of the day, it does come down to that feel. And then on board the boat, we can kind of break down that communication between Matt and myself to, to give the feedback to each other. Of, do we think we're too fast or too slow? Um, and I guess upwind that was often in my kind of hands to, to help control that a little bit. And then downwind Matt um, was in a better spot being more static in the boat to be able to, to contribute that and to see the other boats around as a reference. So. Got one for Victor here. This is from Zoe Dransfield, who I'm guessing is uh, John's daughter. Uh, well Hello. done, guys, and thanks for sharing your photos. For Victor, how do you think the 470 boat setup will change with a male-female pairing? Uh, I would say not a lot, not a lot, because we had, <clears throat> now we had uh, two classes. For 70 men and for 70 women, what was the difference? Very, very tiny. But now we have mixed class. Would be even less difference between men and less difference between women. It will be like exactly what we have for 70 standards. Absolutely the same. I would not say we would use softer mass or stiffer center boards or different board or different sales. No, it would be the same winning combination what we had before. Absolutely the same. Okay. So, um, question from Pete. Pete's asked, what were the most important lessons from Rio? And I guess I'd like to perhaps add to that and say, what was your biggest takeaway from it? What what what, what did it do the, do for you the most? What What was the greatest about your Rio experience and what did you learn? Matt? Uh, we learned a lot through that through that program. Um, you know, we we tried to structure the program um, to be a little bit more domestic based, not as much as what we did over the last eighteen months. Um, but we we just found it was really hard to to be able to to have time to to work on the skills or those one percenters that we knew that we were we were capable of. We we had sort of travelled the world a lot um, to the point that. We were platinum on almost four or five different airlines, um, and just that fatigue and that that sort of being on the on tour um, for such a long long time and a large amount of time. And I think that we we really structured you know good partnerships with Japan for this cycle. Uh, we did that very early in the in the we um, yeah we're just very very detailed in in what we what we knew we wanted to do and and had a, a more balance between life and and campaign. And, and to really give ourselves that opportunity to get into the detail to to deliver you know our best our best performance um, and I think that we really focused on ourselves this last campaign um, and we were really only concerned about getting our best performance whereas I think for Rio um, there was a lot of distractions um, you know it was very very hard because we were on tour so much um, we we couldn't hide as much as we I guess what we ultimately could do in the last 18 months. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of lessons, um, but obviously we, you know, we we learned well enough uh, and was able to to sort of regroup and and that's I guess what we're most proud of. Yes, the gold medal, but the actual performance we were able to deliver at the moment in the time that we needed to, um, you know, whether that would have been gold, silver, or bronze, if, if we had that feeling that we knew we were doing the best that we could, um, that's the the biggest takeaway from for, for me. Well. Yeah, I think Matt summarized it pretty well. Um, I know prior to this Olympics, most of what we talked about from the from the uh, Rio one was when I fell in the water at the in that last race, and that was something that kind of just showed the strength in the team that we had between Matt, Victor, and myself. Um, there's no kind of like reflection on making the mistake. It was like, okay, how do we get on and, and make the best of the next one? And and that was exactly as Matt said. It was about the the delivering the best performance we could in Tokyo and. And that was probably why it was so enjoyable. Like, yes, we were isolated, but it just meant that we were only talking to each other and just reminding each other why we were there to, to sail as well as we could and to enjoy it. For being, and that last race, I think, summarizes it best. It was the last men's 470 Olympic race that we could compete in, um, and we weren't going to let that opportunity slip away. That was cool. And a, perhaps a closing comment from you, uh, Victor. Are you, are you still learning? Absolutely. Absolutely, and um, <clears throat> every day is learning day. Even now, 
like I'm not coaching, but I'm learning a lot about what we've done before, what what was the key factors for us to win, and um, where I was good and where where I was not very good, and what I have to do to be better. That's what I'm thinking every day, and uh, this is the same. As soon as you stop to do this, as soon as you stop learning, finish your life is done. As soon as you are still learning, you are moving forward. That's that's in the rule. Good on you. And uh, Tony Tony Attridge has asked Matt Belcher, how do you balance Rika and the kids against Victor and Will? You got some pretty strong relationships. How how do they compete in your life? How do you find enough time for both? I don't know who's stronger, <laughs> Will or Victor or Ricky. <laughs> um, you know, I think you, it's just it's not possible unless you have. Uh, such a large amount of support and trust between, you know, I guess both sides in any in any situation. And, you know, I can't thank Will and Victor enough to to have that flexibility. And if that meant that, you know, Will and Victor put their hands up and 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 Ian as well to to drive that extra four or five hours and and to come a little bit closer or um, to structure the training to 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 really match some of the key moments with 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 the kids that I really that they knew that I, you know, I, I even if, if I weren't there, I probably weren't going to be at training because I just my mind would be somewhere else. And um, yeah, I mean that's it. Just wasn't wasn't possible to be able to do that. And and for Riki to to balance the three you know the three kids um, and for her to to put you know, her life on on hold. You know, it's a real family a family effort. And you know, Riki and I for twelve years we we toured the world. You know, we we started for seven years together. Um, you know, and to go to the games together, she knew exactly what what it was about and she knew how important it was for for me for the family and um yeah they were they were so so happy and it's great that the kids are a bit older to realize that as to why i'm away and and to get that appreciation of how special campaigning um, and how special it is to represent your country and you know it's um it's been so so great to to see um how proud they are and and um and to see how motivated they are to to get into sport which is which is great well, that's a great note to finish on. Look, I really hate to do this because um, we could talk easily for another hour and there's so many questions that I feel guilty for leaving. And I do apologise to everybody out there that didn't get their question asked. So I do apologise. But I'd like to um, just thank the guys. I, I, this is the third similar session that I've had with the three of you since you've come back. And I know I've only been at some of them. So the way you the way you put in back into the sport after returning from Tokyo and actually from all the games and events you've been in before is phenomenal. I mean, the sport is stronger because of the attitudes of people like you and how you put back. And I know you're working very, very hard behind the scenes to help Australian sailing and to help young people and to foster the development of our sport. And I just, I, I think you're just sensational. So thanks for tuning in, everybody out there. A huge thank you to uh, Matt Belcher, Victor Kovalenko and uh, Will Ryan. It's been fantastic to hear about your experiences. And I think we had a bit of humour and a, bit, a few good stories and we made it a bit of fun. But it's really good to see your photos and to hear your perspectives on things. As I said earlier, uh, there are still a few webinars to come. So there are still a few opportunities for the sailing community to connect with our Olympians. And as I said we, earlier, we have Matt Wern uh, next Tuesday. Look out for the details on Australian Sailing's social media. On that note, uh, I've got a meeting to go to. Um, I'm off. Thanks, guys, so much for your involvement. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Good night to everybody. And go Australian sailing. Bye. Thanks, guys.